Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 20 Live today. It's Saturday, March the 2nd, 2013. Our topic today is stretch and scratch, and we have a special guest with us today, Heidi Williams, and we're really appreciative that she's with us today. And I always want to send a shout out to uh, Tammy Moore and Laurie Moffitt in the chat who are great at this uh, with answering collecting questions. Laurie does that, and Tammy Moore, as I've let some people know, offers close captioning for anyone in the session or for people uh, after watching the recording, they can pick up the uh, closed captioning. So it's great to have you with us today, and I want to share with you a couple of things that uh, you may not be aware of if you're new, and just a reminder for those people who've uh, just joined the recording, we do keep a collection of all our links that are shared during the session in our live binder, and I think um, either Peggy or Kim are going to drop that link in the chat. So um, we are enjoying the uh, side tab view of the live binder, and you can click all the way up and down for the the resources and links that are shared during the session. And just to give you a heads up, if during the conversation that find we find that you have uh, links that are appropriate to the show, that we will be collecting them and adding them to our live binder near the end of the show. And my phone is going off here and I hope that's not being irritating. So, and I can't do much about it right now. My apologies for that. We talked about the live binder just now for resources for sharing materials for you today. Then uh, we also want to bring your attention to, we have a, a website live.classroom20.com and we direct you to the archives and resources page because we have uh, great offerings there for you. You'll see the full Blackboard Collaborate uh, recording as well as an MP3 file. Uh, an MP4 file is embedded as a video file so that you can take and share the bed and code and place it where you think it's appropriate, maybe for sharing with other people in your district for professional development. You'll see the links, again, similar to the live binder. All the links are, are shared there as well and the link to the live binder. And I did forget to mention one thing to you in the live binder, that there is a specific tag for Classroom 2.0 live and it gives you links to our survey which it pops up in the end and any of our resources that are specific to our show you'll find in that tab. So I think I've, oh, one more thing is the chat. We talked about how quickly it goes back and forth and that we do keep a uh, log of the chats and it's posted for you on the record archives and resources page. So now is your time to participate and I need you to get that laser pointer the second icon down to the left of your whiteboard, you need to click on that, drag your mouse over, and drag it. Tell us where you're located in the world. And if it's not working for you, please feel free to type it. And it's that's kind of a great backup for me because I'm not always sure where your um, starbursts are showing. But we really like to have um, to not only to get you awake and, and clicking with your pointer, it's just a really good sense of where our audience is across the world and it reinforces how much we are a global learning community. So great, thank you very much. Your next job will be voting. So remember I said just below your name on the right hand side that check mark. So you're going to click on that and make your voting option for have you used Scratch with your students. And I'm just waiting for people to vote. Have quite a few people in the session. Just for those who made up, picked that up. The voting option is just below your name. That check mark gives you a drop-down menu to make your selection. Green check if it's yes, and a red X if it's no. You can't actually click on the slide to make your vote. So I think I have most everyone's votes, and I'm going to publish the results to the whiteboard so we can give a sense. So there you go, Heidi. Most of the people in the session have not used Scratch with their students. Moving on to our second poll question, have you ever heard of Stretch? So let me clear the votes, please, and then go ahead and vote now. Have you ever heard of Stretch? Green check it. If you have, red X if you haven't. I think most people have voted again, so let's take a look at the results, and there we go again. About 50% of us, Heidi, have not heard of Stretch. 
So I just need to change the voting options to our next question. Just give me a second here. And we're going to move on to our final poll question. Is Would you be interested more in A, learning how to use Scratch, or B, learning how to incorporate Scratch into your curriculum, or C, both equally, A and B? So there you go ahead and let's uh, give Heidi an answer. I think most people have had a chance to vote. Let's see what the answer is. I kind of think it's C, and I'm right. So look, people are looking highly into both A and B equally. Wrong, and this is my opportunity to take a few minutes to introduce Heidi Williams to you. And our topic today is stretch with scratch. So, for those of you who don't know what stretch is, I know Heidi's going to talk about it more, but it means striving to reach every talented uh, child. Uh, right now, Heidi is currently the K 12 intervention coach at Kowaskam School District in Kowaskam, Wisconsin. She works with teachers and administrators to implement best practice innovative curriculum options for all students, excuse me. Before that, she was a stretch instructor at Bayside Middle School in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Her roles included differentiation, technology integration, and stretching the personal growth of both students and teachers. Her focus was shifting away from a traditional gifted and talented model and moving toward a talent development model called stretch, striving to reach every talented child, which I just said. She obtained her master's degree in curriculum instruction from Walden University and her bachelor's degree in elementary education from the University of Wisconsin. Wisconsin. She also holds her mentoring certificate from Cardinal Stritch University and her online teaching certificate from the University of Wisconsin. She also sits on, on the ISTE Special Interest Group as a middle school representative. And her passions include K-8 computer programming and helping to shift the pedagogy of education to include learning that happens outside of the school day. So it is wonderful to have you with us today. And again, we're most appreciative of you taking the time to get your presentation uh, ready. I know it's awesome it's coming in for being with us today. We're going to turn the microphone over to you, and I'm going to give you the newbie question today. That is, what is Scratch, and how can it be used to support student learning? Awesome question. Take Thank away, you please. for the wonderful introduction. I'm really glad to be with you guys here today. Um, the reason I had those poll questions in the beginning is because I really want to differentiate because I model differentiation for professional development and for everything that we do with teachers, not only with what we do with kids. So knowing that you guys kind of want that equal balance when I do my talk today and I start talking about scratch and stretch, I'll make sure that I do a balance of you know, what it is, how it works, and the different types of projects that you can do with it. So what is Scratch and how can it be used to support student learning? Well, Scratch is an open source computer programming language that was developed by MIT. And interestingly enough, one of the things that I found interesting, I thought creating from scratch, that kind of thing. But when I talked to Mitch Resnick, he's the uh, gentleman from MIT that helped create the scratch programming language, he said it goes back to DJ times when they would do things with music and they would take your old vinyl records, which I know younger people don't even know what those are anymore, but you took your big vinyl 33 records and you would actually move them with your finger and get the scratching type of noise and sound off the records that changed the music and was very creative. So I found that very interesting to know the background of Scratch. The power of it is that it is very visual. It's very much like Lego blocks that kids can link together. So K-8 teachers, because it's so user-friendly and the kids really enjoy it, they can learn how to code without necessarily getting caught up in the syntax of code. And it really can apply to their curricular areas. Any kind of content knowledge can be shown in Scratch. Computational thinking is definitely shown in Scratch. And what we're finding is when working with kids, that their math skills are increasing, even though they're not maybe directly working with a math project, we might be creating a language arts project, but their math skills are increasing because everything's based on a four quadrant graphing system and they are applying those math skills through the use of whatever it is content area that they're working in. So, 
then I'll just go on to my presentation. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, hearing you great, Heidi. Go ahead. All right, beautiful. All right, so stretch with scratch, striving to reach every talented child. Stretch stands for striving to reach every talented child, and it's really a pedagogy shift. When I first started working at Bayside Middle School, it was a very affluent area, huge demographics of quote unquote gifted kids because many of them had a lot of background. They tested very high on their standardized testing. So I had to start thinking about how I could shift how we identified and serviced kids because otherwise uh, I wasn't meeting the needs of some of the top um, that really, really needed that really far stretch. And I'll show you some of the projects today that uh, one of the kids in the Bayside Stretch program was working on. But really stretch is about all kids. So when I would go in and work with a group of kids, it was about stretching their learning. So if they were really low and one of those struggling students, we stretched it. If they were average, we stretched it. And if they were really high, we stretched it even further to make sure that they continued to grow and learn. So the stretch philosophy really plays into Wisconsin right now has a huge push with RTI, response to intervention, and meeting the needs through levels of service. And it's perfect to tie this gifted philosophy into those levels of service because what we know about our brains and how, they, how, how it acquires information, if I use a skill and I use it repeatedly over and over and over, if you follow the talent code, um, it wraps our myelin even thicker and thicker each time we do it. The brain's a muscle, the brain grows, the brain can atrophy, the brain can become damaged as when you're in a car accident and have traumatic brain injury. But then the brain can still learn how to do things even after that. So the notion of IQ and static types of testing opportunities identifying kids doesn't necessarily work. If I identified a kid in as gifted in science, he may be great in biology, but when we go to study chemistry, he might not have a clue. So it, it really goes into that flow of providing levels of service to kids, differentiating their instruction based on what they need, and kind of creating that paradigm shift that we're using technology now, and kids have exposure to technology all the time, not just inside of school, but outside of school. And when they come to us, we have to recognize that they're still learning outside of school and figure out how to incorporate that into our instruction, and that can be really difficult to do. So that's just a little bit of background on the stretch. Scratch, and the reason I was drawn to Scratch, is that it is naturally differentiated within the programming pieces of Scratch with what kids can do it, can do with it. So you'll see that as we go on, and you'll see those differentiated pieces as I kind of show and I kind of explain those. And then the title, Because the Cat Goes Left. I'm going to leave you wondering, and I'll come back to that at the end, but for those of you in the survey, when you took it, who said that they had background knowledge and have been using Scratch, think about that. What might that mean? Because the cat goes left. What might that mean? So again, going back to the whole notion of computational thinking, Google right now has a huge push towards computational thinking. And in the live binder, you'll see some resources from the Google page that um, goes into all the different aspects and has different resources that you can use on computational thinking. It's really everything underneath the kitchen sink because it can be applied to any single subject area, anything that you're doing. Even um, our district, we were talking about that RTI process and what it needs to look, look like. Who gets the first step from there? Who does what? And we actually created a flow chart and documented our computational thinking around the process of how we're serving kids. The other big push for the computational thinking comes from the Computer Science Teachers Association, which I also happen to be a member of, and their link for their computational thinking flyers up there. But just to highlight some of those key points here, we have the formulating pro problems, logically organizing and analyzing data, the abstractions, the algorithmic thinking, um, identifying, analyzing, and implementing possible solutions, generalizing and transferring this problem-solving process. If we take those things that are bulleted here in red, which are the computational thinking pieces, and we take a look at the 21st century fluency, and if you've ever 
had a uh, been a committed sardine, and if you Google committed sardine, you will find the 21st Century Fluency Projects. Well, a lot of these flow right into the pieces of computational thinking and what we're trying to get out of what kids are doing. When you think of the computational thinking process, and then we also look at those fluencies, and we have that creativity fluency, that's what I want to take just a few more minutes and expand on. How can we take that creativity and put it and filter it into all those different pieces with the solution and the information and the media and the collaboration when we actually show our video games and people start playing them. So we have a short clip here on computational thinking and how creativity can play into that. So we'll watch that clip. Then I'll let Peggy put that on for me, please. About the percentage. I figure 75% to you, Panma. And 25% divided between the five of us. Yida, Crowbar, myself, Tom, and the baby. That makes 5% for each one of us. Ah, uh, 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 Billy, you're cheating yourself. If there's 25% divided among the five of you, that's 14% apiece. Oh, no, listen, Pa. I, I wouldn't cheat you. You know I wouldn't. Now, look. Look here. I'll show you. Let me rub this out here. And now, 25 divided by 5 is 5. You see, you, 5 won't go into 2, will it? No. But 5 goes into 25 five times, you see? No, you're wrong, Billy. Now, now, I'm pretty good mathematician. Now, 5 into 25... So, as you can see, I love that video because it goes two, into a no. lot of... But 5 goes into 5 once. Now, we didn't use the 2 before, so we bring it down here. Now, 5 into 20 goes four times. There you are. 5 into 25, 14. No, look, Pa. Uh, let me prove it to you now by multiplication. Uh, 5 times 5. 5 times 5 is 25. Really? I'm surprised to learn. Yes, Heidi, but hopefully she'll be back shortly. Now I'll show you. 5 times 14. You know, I'll take a look at the... Five times four is twenty. Life finder clip. Five times one is five. Twenty-five. That's it. No, no. Look, Ma. Look, you're wrong there because you know, I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'll, we'll put down four, five fourteens here. Fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. There. Now, now I'll prove to you by addition that that five fourteens is not twenty-five. Four, eight. 12, 16, 20, 21, Welcome back, Tammy. 22, uh, 23, 24, Heidi. Yeah, 25. Yeah, watch us. There you are. Better brush up, Billy. All right, so back where I was at. Um, talking about that, again, that creativity piece. That creativity piece is huge. And when you program things within Scratch, if you program it and it doesn't work and your thinking is incorrect, the program's not going to work. You're not going to get it to do what you want it to do unless the programming is correct. So it's really interesting because kids can actually see math in action by doing this. So looking at uh, this next slide, stretch children's behavior and characteristics. When we look at quote unquote gifted characteristics, these were things that were listed um, on, the, on one of the websites for gifted education. You have things such as acquiring skills more quickly, tackling tasks and problems, the cause effects relationships, looking at anom anomalies and analyzing it systematically. These are all things that you can tap into when you start working with computer programming and coding in kids with Scratch. So how can you incorporate it into your curriculum? Well, here's an example of a sixth grade project that I did with a language arts game. The purpose of this was the kids were talking about verbs, and they had to do things with action verbs and helping verbs. And I went to the classroom teacher as a collaborator and asked her, you know, what have you done with this in the past? And she talked about how they made board games, and they made noun board games, and they made verb board games. I said, well, how would you like to try having the kids create their own video game? Basically the same thing. 
sat down, we looked at a rubric, we looked at the requirements, we gave the kids a requirement checklist of certain content they had to have. We did an intro to Scratch with them on the very first day that they worked on the project. The intro took maybe 15, 20 minutes of class time, then they tried out those skills. As they were using those skills, we found out that kids had questions and we gave them slips of paper to keep their questions on and turn those in as their exit tickets on the way out. Then when they came back the next day, we spent about 10 to 15 minutes going over those questions so they could add more tools to their tool bag and then continue to work. Same process happened the next day. By about Thursday, we had covered the majority of the questions and everybody was well underway into creating their video games. We uh, had a full work day on Friday and we let them come back to the lab on that next Monday for finishing touches. But it took a solid week in the lab to create the games. And we also knew that we were going to have students and we looked at their math scores and in our case we used the NWEA MAP scores and the, and the teacher input on where they were at mathematically with mathematical skills that we thought that might get in the way of being able to create a video game. So we identified the kids that had exceeded the expectations, that met expectations, the ones that were still struggling with some of those math concepts and differentiated around that. So this first student was one of the struggling students. His name's Harry. We gave him specific things that we wanted him to work on and for our struggling students we told them that they had to make a maze. So this was his video game. And we focused on this project with the students with moving the arrow keys and cardinal directions. There's many different ways within Scratch that you can use the arrow keys and have them move. Um, you set up, first of all, what direction you're going to go, whether it's going to be up, down, right, or left. And the first step is the cardinal directions. If I point zero or up, it's going to go up. If you go negative 90, that's going to go to the left. Obviously, positive is going to go to the right, and down would be the 180 degrees will point down. So we talked about those cardinal directions with that student. With some of the other students, they started programming their up, down, right, and left arrow keys using a change in x-axis or a change in y-axis because they had a little bit more experience with mathematics under their belt. So again, focusing on just those arrow keys with that student. And then the other thing we did within the maze is for our struggling students, we basically had them create three sprites that would be way paths that their maze or that their maze could go, and then they had costumes. We set up costumes for them, and they just had to change the words that they wanted to match the content, whatever they were asking for. So that if they were asking for action verbs or being verbs, it depended on what kind of costume they had. So we kind of set up this template form for those kids to be successful when working with Scratch. And everybody created a Scratch project and everybody that we gave the maze to was successful. There were even a couple other kids who took it one step further and made even more customizations to their maze when they were working on the project itself. And I know, um, Peggy, if you guys could put up the links in the chat to these projects as we go by them, that way when I'm going through and explaining them, if you want to, you can actually pull them up in your browser off the Scratch um, website, off MIT's website where the kids uploaded the project so they can actually Honey, we'll be right back. We lost her again. There she is. Sorry, I'm back again. I don't know why I keep getting kicked out. I'm actually going to have my husband uh, take a look at setting up my Mac and uh, getting me on there and see if I can get on, on there as well if I get kicked out again. All right going on to the next project. Here's the one with meets expectations. So a lot of our kids that met the expectations uh, for mathematics and we felt had a really pretty good solid understanding, a lot of them created mazes, not all of them did, 
but we can see within the student's programming, this is Matt, Matt starts experimenting with a couple different things. He starts experimenting with asking questions. So in Scratch, there are some sensing blocks where you can ask a question and then wait for the participant to put it in an answer. So in this case, he started then using the asking questions and the if-else statements. So if the answer is this, I want it to say, great, amazing. If it's not this, then I want it to say, oh, nope, sorry, the correct answer was something different. So he's starting to go above and beyond uh, the simple basic programming that the first student was, and he's starting to look at if then, and then those ask, asking questions. He also started incorporating using the pen. And if any of you are old timers out there and you remember logo and you remember creating those turtles with logo, uh, th this is what the pen down is like. I can actually create shapes. So if you're looking at Matt's project and you start to play it, you'll notice that when you uh, click on the game to start, he will actually move and as he moves, the pen will follow his track. So this student is showing skills of using that pen down as well as more advanced coordinate graphing skills. In order for that pen uh, to be able to go through and follow the track, he has to program the X and Y coordinate graphs to follow along through his maze. Then we have Caroline here, and this actually was an awesome project. And last year at ISTE, I brought girl programmers, and I had a student showcase that was focused around girl program, programmers, programmers called GPS, Girls Programming in Scratch. And I brought this example with me to show because it was really one of my favorites. Caroline is one of those students who's in the 98th percentile for math, 98th percentile for reading, very high performing, works extremely hard. Uh, she started to play around with broadcast and receive and different levels. So if they complete this level, and as you're playing her game for Caroline's with the cheese puffs, you'll notice that when you drag those puff bowls to her character's mouth, her score will also increase. And once that level's done, she needed to get a way to figure out how to go to the next level. And that's when she started using those broadcasts. So she would broadcast different things and then receive it in order to make her game progress. She was also creating variables, which was above what we were expecting with the kids. She added a score component. So if you had the correct score, and you got to a certain score, then it would do something different within the program. Here's another one, a social studies project. And this was done by a third grader. In working with my daughter's school, actually, they were having the kids do a PowerPoint presentation on a country. Her country happened to be Sri Lanka. She went to her teacher and said, hey, instead of doing this PowerPoint presentation, could I do a computer video game instead and program my presentation? So her project works very much like a PowerPoint presentation going from side to side to side, but she does the broadcast and receive commands in order to make it go through the slides. And she was also able to do a voiceover for each slide in order to cover the content requirements that they were looking for. Now her mom at the very end, unbeknown to her, because mom came in when she did her presentation because she had some snacks to give to the kids from her country, I put a little slide in at the very end that said, hey, way to go, Bailey, mom's proud of you. So she saw that on the day of the presentation, it was kind of cute. So again, focusing in on the broadcasting and voiceovers is really fun to do with kids if they're gonna do a PowerPoint, have some of your higher mathematical kids program theirs instead of just doing a PowerPoint. Here's an example of a seventh grade social studies project called the Mayan ball game. In the beginning of this project, very, very similar to a PowerPoint presentation. However, this student right here is an advanced math student. In seventh grade, he was going over to our high school taking geometry. So he was able to incorporate those advanced math skills into his project. Not only did he do the project, but he also at the very end had a game that you could play where it would shoot uh, a ball through the hoop just like it would in the real Mayan ball game. 
Now, if you look at his programming here, definitely some advanced use of variables where he was creating uh, different types of things based on variables. And then also advanced operators and coordinate graphing. You'll notice that he has to really know and do things based on the X and Y coordinates of where that ball was. He's also using the operators when he set the variable power. He has power here and he's multiplying it by two tenths. So again, all these advanced math skills you can see in here. You know, and I just thought, Doug, Doug, I just want to comment on Alice real quick because you mentioned Alice. Alice is very nice, and actually one of the girls that I took to ISTE was also programming in Alice. She was a high schooler, and she really, really enjoyed doing that after doing these scratch pieces because she was doing scratch in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and then went on to start using Alice. As an educator, when I look at Alice programming and I look at scratch programming side by side, I can intuitively tell where a kid is and see a kid's computational thinking a little bit easier than I can in Alice because of the fact that it's color coded. Uh, Alice, when you do the different strings, everything's kind of like a grayish color. It's not quite as color coordinated. When the kids get into more of those advanced programming pieces because it's more three dimensional and it's more graphics intuitive for Alice, it's a great stepping stone. Um, for the kids to go to. So, uh, yeah, I love Alice as well. Here's an eighth grade science project, how it can be used with science. I had two eighth grade boys who had done a lot of the different kinds of stretch opportunities at Bayside, and one of the requirements for eighth grade, the science teacher every year had the kids make a children's sound book. Well, one of these boys is dysgraphic, so he really hates holding pencils. He can only hold pens and write with pens. He really didn't want to do the whole thing where he had to gra do graphics and illustrate uh, the children's sound book, not his thing. So what he and his um, partner decided to do, they asked if they could make a children's sound book using Scratch. It was actually wonderful because they got into animation. When you take a look at that project, right here with the animation pieces on the right hand side here, you can see the different molecules as different costumes going through. The kids created animations by switching the costumes every two seconds so that it looked and appeared when the kids would read the book that the molecules were moving. And they also incorporated some sounds into the sound book that are based on high frequency and low frequency, and also some things based on pitch. The teacher was really, really impressed, although she was a little bit leery about the students doing this the first time. I sat down with her, we looked at the rubric, we modified the rubric a little bit to match what the boys, what the boys did and what they had to work on content-wise. But then it was really powerful because when these went down to the fourth grade, because the fourth graders were the ones that actually graded and assessed, comments and feedback came back from the fourth graders that they really liked the fact that they could see the molecules in action. They could see the things and it was interactive with them, that they liked that interactive book. And if anybody's ever seen the YouTube video, there's, it's really cute, just YouTube, iPad and 18 month old baby. A mom gives a baby an iPad, and the baby's manipulating the iPad and touching it and making it do things. Then she takes the iPad away, and she puts a magazine in front of the child. And the child becomes very frustrated with that magazine. It's magazine. She's pointing, and she's trying to get the magazine to work, and the magazine just won't work. She doesn't, even, doesn't really even think about flipping it open. And even when she does, when she tries to point, it won't do anything. Our world's becoming very touch oriented and very interactive oriented. And the fact that the kids could interact with this book, the fourth graders, was something that they really enjoyed. Reading projects. This was really one of my favorite reading projects, and I was devastated because I have in here before the scandal uh, the author of the book who. Uh, actually went through and said that all these things happened. They found out it was a scandal. I'm sure you guys know the whole story about three cups of tea, so I won't go into that. But these boys, uh, while they were working on the project, although it never got finished, and the reason it didn't get finished is because we found out about the scandal about a quarter of the way into the project, so they decided to abandon it. 
because they wanted to actually post this on a website to do some um, fundraising and do some a community service project with it. I love their main screen here, A production, actually taking the creativity of putting the words in here to make it look like the mountain I thought was really fantastic. So this project here, the players, it had to do with content knowledge. So who's the main character's bodyguard? Answer. It did a lot of answer types of things and it increased score. And the whole thing was to, if you got it correct with this cup of tea that you were drinking, you would receive a penny and then the pennies would keep building upon itself. So the sketch outline of that project is online and I did leave it online. However, the reason the kids didn't finish it again was because of the scandal. Interestingly enough, uh, when they decided not to do that project, we flipped it over to do something else, and we actually ended up doing a community service around a flash mob. So I actually got a chance to uh, take some girls and boys, and we created a dance, and watching 7th and 8th grade boys dance along with the girls was kind of funny, but it was a flash mob, so there was some good that came out of it. This next one for reading, reading and content areas. Here was a student who, again, mathematically was ahead. So the instructor asked the student to do some research and do some reading on fractals. And this is the student, it counted for both a reading and a math project. It was a journey through fractal world, kind of a storyland type of thing that went through teaching you about the different characteristics of fractals. Foreign language ideas. Here's uh, another one that one of the students did who was doing something for a foreign language class where they could learn about days of the week, colors, salutations, numbers. And then Common Core Math. Uh, I'm focusing a lot on trying to not necessarily have the kids create the project from scratch, huh, no pun intended, but actually take and look at a Common Core Math standard and figure out how can we create a game that the kids can break apart, analyze, manipulate, personalize and make their own and get at some of the really in-depth things that the Common Core talks about. So this is one of the ones that I've created that revolves around the fifth grade, a fifth grade standard that has to do with uh, estimation. And uh, it's actually, and I can't remember if we have it linked into the Scratch. I actually have this project posted under the Scratch Ed website. And if it's not in that Live Binder, I will actually go in and add it to the Live Binder because I have the whole project outlined. It has a teacher work page. And on the teacher work page, it goes through how to install it, how to get to this project, where it's located, and then what the students are going to do with it. In this case, for this project, when the bananas come up on the screen, Sport. and that's the nice thing about the game piece of it, it does or not testing. give you enough Typically. time to physically count every single banana. You're going to have to come up with an estimation strategy because it doesn't stay on the screen long enough. Because I love it when a problem, they give you this math problem that says, oh, estimate how much it would, or you know, how, how, how many cranes would be in each box when it's a static problem and you can actually have the crayons drawn out there for you and you can actually count them, but they ask you to estimate. So this way they can actually really do estimation. You can talk about estimation strategies. Then after that, when you open up the programming blocks, it has them take a look at, in the original game, in the four different rounds, it stamps or repeats that banana image different amounts of times. So first of all, how many times is it stamped there? Now you create a game and you manipulate those numbers and you change them to stamp a different amount of time. Then if you keep going on in the worksheet, it asks them to look at the acceptable range of values of the estimation time. How much time is it realistic value-wise to give for them to be able to estimate? Well, of course, as the, as the number that you need to estimate increases, the value and length of time you have to give them increases. The other thing it has kids look at is what is an acceptable range of answers? If my estimation is 10, hopefully I'm only off by one on either side. But if my estimation is 76, what is that acceptable range, range both below and above in order to get that amount, you know, to, to estimate that amount? So that's another thing that uh, you can do with Scratch. So far I've got two things that are created for that. This is one and then there's another one that I worked on that has to do with counting and it has to do with cardinality of numbers. 
And one of the last ones that I want to show you before I open it up for question and answer is this engagement. When we did that verb project with everybody with the entire grade level, we had close to 100% engagement from 100% of the kids almost 100% of the time. Now, you can never be at 100%, but one of the reasons why we did this was the teacher was struggling with engagement. Well, when we had the kids engaged, we had them. And then when we made things acceptable to the level that we were at, we differentiated what we wanted them to be able to do so that they were successful, they were all just right there. So here again, talking about the differentiation piece, this is a science project that was done by a fourth grade student. Her name is Bailey. She had taken a pretest because this teacher, the teacher she has is very, very strong in differentiation. She pretests the kids in almost every single concept before they start to study it. And Bailey in her pretest had gotten an 84%. Everybody else was well under 50%. So she asked Bailey, hey Bailey, what would you like to study about electricity? She's like, well, you know what? I'd really like to help my classmates. How about if I create a review game? So her teacher said, yeah, great. So she went and created this review game, and I actually have an interview here with Bailey that I would like to show you guys, uh, since we're close to the um, end here before question and answer, that you guys can see. So Peggy, if you can put that video up. Hi, we're here today with Bailey. Hi. My name is Bailey. I am the creator and chief director of this video game. Why did you create this scratch project? I created this scratch project to help my classmates and peers study for their magnetism and electricity test. Tell us what's going on. What's happening here? Well, Jordan, my character, is asking what your name is. And it asks you the questions, like... Do iron nails stick to magnets? And if you type in the wrong answer, it says no. The correct answer was yes. And as you see, if you type in the right answer, it gives you, increases your score. Well, in asking all these questions, Bailey, that's really cool. But how did you get the game to do that? How did you program the game to do the questions? Well, if you look right inside the top left corner, there are at least eight panels, control, sensing, operators, variables, motion, looks, sound, and pen. Now, what I started with was sensing. As you can see, there's an ask, what's your name, and wait. I use that to make, to ask the question. And then, I went over to the control panel. And I scrolled down a bit, and I saw if else, so I used that instead of if. And then I went over to the operator, and I used the equals bar, and then I went over to the sensing bar, and used the answer panel. And then on the right side of the green um, shape, I typed in yes, because that was the answer to the question. And then I went back over to the variables and took the change score by one and put it up there if they said yes. And I went over to the looks and said say. I would say great job for at least three seconds. Else is if you answered the question wrong. It would say, nice try, but the right answer was yes. Great, besides asking all these questions, what else did you have your game do? Well, if you scroll down, right there I broadcast ball off. Let's see what happens. What happens? Well, if you look right. at what she's saying, you have to use the arrows to move candy. the wire on the left, 
and U for up, and D for I, down, I R for right, and L for left me. to I move the wire on the right. Some of you were What's the goal about, here? What are they trying um, to do? They're trying to get the light bulb light by connecting the wires to the light bulb and the do so. The wires help the electricity flow through into the light bulb. And you see saw it. That there, be a teacher well, as you can see, there are three ma bar magnets held together shown. Plus the space bar to find out what the choices are. There's A, B, C, and D, D. And what would the correct answer be, Bailey? It would be B, because if you can see, N and S attract, but S and S don't. As my teacher says, opposites attract and same and same repel. As you can see, she's asking some questions. A bulb and a lamp uses electricity in two. How do you know that they typed the right word in, Bailey? Right there, it says, for the next questions, fill in the blank. And it asks it. I did two of those because they might do it with a capital L. So I put light and light. So, Bailey, what kind of feedback did your classmates give you when they played the game? Well, they said that I should have slowed down the scripts because they could barely read them. I'm glad that they said that. Next time when I make another scratch project, I'll make sure to check on that. And how were their test scores, Bailey? Did they increase? Did they have fun playing the game? Yes, they did have fun playing the game. I was amazed by their test scores. Almost 25 people got A's. Yeah, when I looked at the test scores, I think the highest score was 100 and the lowest score was a 73. Do you think other kids in your class would like to learn how to program like this? Yes, a lot of them said that they would like to. What did your teacher think about Scratch? She thinks that it was amazing, and my teacher last year was amazed by my Sri Lanka project. Thanks for joining us today, Bailey. Thanks. I had a fun time being here. that they want them to play as a review for a test without necessarily having to know all the coding of creating a game with, with coding script. So make sure that you guys follow that uh, K-8 programming playground. And then I'm, I also have a blog for computational thinking, which I do do a lot of posting. When I post new things in the K-8 programming playground and I update that website, I'll usually stick something in there about a blog. And for those of you that are interested in intervention and RTI, that intervention corner is a great place to just get a ton of different resources and how we can differentiate for kids. But Scratch really does lend itself into that differentiation. So Peggy, I don't know, or, or Lorna, do we want to open it up for questions? And yes, Scratch is a downloadable program. Um, it's downloadable from the website, from the scratch.mit website. If you actually go to that K-8 programming playground, there's a, a link in there that s explains specifically for teachers what they have to do and how to do download it. Or if you have an IT guy, what you need to tell the IT guy from your district to do to put it on all computers. And for Kim, programming always seems seems daunting to me. Don't worry, it did to me as well. If you just jump in there, you can kind of learn right with the kids. And to be really honest, when I started doing this, I had no programming background. Hadn't I, I dabbled in it just a little bit before I started with the kids. And then we opened it up and we started working with it. And I thought through the process with the kids and learned what some of the blocks did with the kids. Sometimes the ki I even learned from the kids, especially that advanced math student was helping me really understand a little bit more about variables and lists and how to use them with other kids. And yes, you can embed a game into a blog um, because I've done that with some of mine. What you do is there is an embed code on the Scratch website. So when you're on that Scratch website, if you look on the right hand side where the game is, it'll say embed code. You just have to copy and then paste that into your blog.
And Sam was mentioned earlier, and there's a question about the new version being accessible via a web browser. Yes, they were. They, they, I know that they are looking at that. And actually, if you go to the Scratch website, they have a beta version out of 2.0. And I also know that they're piloting and they're working with a earlier version of Scratch called Scratch Junior. They're working on creating that for K2 students. And somebody asked if you're looking forward to the Scratch 2 version. Yeah, I actually have downloaded it and have been playing it a little bit, playing around with it a little bit. Uh, there's more that you can do with uh, the variables and some different things that you can do with lists. Also, another thing that I've been playing around with, Kinnick for the Xbox. You, there's actually a gentleman that has a program, and I've, I've just hooked it up, and I'm just beginning to play with it. But you can actually interface Scratch with Kinnick on the Xbox. So you could do some different kinds of games with that as well. Oh, that's interesting to be able to use it that way. That would definitely be intriguing um, to see how those uh, play together and work together. Um, Jason asked how he could fit Scratch into uh, a high school function course. Um, well, depending on what depending on what they're going to do, like I said, as far as some of the really, really advanced math stuff, if he wants to email me that question, what I would do is go to my math resource because I have, like I said, that mathematically talented student that I have, he has an IQ of around 160, and he actually is working with his high school AP Calc teacher and his chemistry teacher on incorporating Scratch into things that they're doing in their classroom with some of those advanced mathematical concepts. So if he wants to email me at that Heidi at stretchinstructor.com, um, I'll put him in touch with Tommy so that Tommy can go over how they're using that at the high school level. Interesting. That will be exciting. So you can, my understanding is that you can make Scratch as um, complex as you need to be regarding the level of difficulty of programming? Yes, you can. And also, um, they have things called Pico boards, which is basically a USB sensor board that interfaces with Scratch as well. You could do things up at the high school level, like uh, programming blinking t-shirts with different LED lights. And oh. that can be very highly engaging with high school kids, especially the high school girls, if you're trying to you know, really try to get those girls engaged in the STEM projects. Because I've seen those uh, really fascinating shirts like at thinkgeek.com and various places. I wondered how they did that. And uh, Peggy asked if the blinking t-shirt is one of the costumes in Scratch. Yeah, no, it's not a costume in Scratch. It's actually a real live t-shirt that would have blinking LED lights. You take the Pico boards, which is basically the USB board, and then you interface that with Scratch, and you program the lights with that board, and then you attach the board to the T-shirt with a blinking light, so you walk around with this shirt that's blinking based on how you programmed it. And Aaron um, asked how you would compare the Pico boards to we do. Uh, a little bit different. We do's really are we do's are really really good for the elementary kids if they want to start playing around with some basic physical concepts of science, because the we do's again will interface right with Scratch, so they can program the motors. Um, I the group of girl programmers that I took to ISTE last year actually took and we took the we do and we took the Scratch stuff with us, and they programmed a flower bed with spinning flowers that would react on your voice. Oh, is that kind of like one of those dancing speakers? Exactly. Uh, exactly like that. Things. <laughs> those are hilarious, but that's a similar process, I would assume. Yeah, and along, along with the we do thing, I know one of the frustrating things I had is I had some older kids in middle school who were trying to do the Mindstorms, the NX Mindstorm, yeah. and that does not interface with Scratch right now, but somebody came out with a program called Enchanting, and enchanting looks very much like Scratch, but you can program the Mindstorm NXT blocks with enchanting. Wow. 
just so fascinating. Um, there's just so many details, and it, it's so awesome that you can use this one program definitely with little students as well as more complex, higher level, um, different content areas and the complex algorithms. We are at the top of the hour. I'm going to go ahead and close out the session, but we invite you to stay on if you're able to. And if you do have to leave, we will continue recording um, the session today. We want to let you know that Steve Hargadon will have several interview sessions next week on March the 4th. He'll be interviewing Richie Norton. March the 5th, Richard Millington. On March the 5th in the evening, he'll be talking about virtual book clubs with Ben Ryan. March the 7th, Chris Cogliano. And on March the 11th, he'll be talking with Paul Thomas. And you can find out more about his interview sessions on futureofeducation.com. And we want to let you know that next week we're going to be having, not, yeah, next week. Um, I can't believe we're in March already. Uh, the featured teacher for March, Jamie Cook, who's an eighth grade math and technology teacher. On March 16th, we'll be talking about Guru for Learning. Um, we're finalizing some details on the March 23rd session, and March 30th is the uh, Saturday of Easter weekend. So we won't have a show then, but we will return on April the 6th with Kyle Pace. We'll be talking about music education and technology. And on April the 13th, we'll have Lisa Dabb, who's going to be talking about new teacher uh, community and the NT chat, if you've seen that on Twitter. So you want to stay tuned for those fantastic sessions. And if you'd like to nominate a featured teacher or nominate yourself or any educator that works with students or colleagues, please feel free to do so. The link is in our live binder and it's also the CR20 live featured teacher N O M I N A T. And we would love to get your feedback and suggest somebody for a future session. You can also request a professional development certificate and we would love to give for you to give us feedback on today's session using the survey link that will automatically open in your browser once you exit this session. And to request the professional development, you will certificate. You can in, uh, submit your name and email address on that survey link, and then Peggy will email those out. And if you watch any of the recorded sessions on any of our archives, you can also use that same link that's in the live binder, and you can uh, request a professional development for a recording certificate for a recording that you have watched. You can also subscribe to our MP or MP4 iTunes U channel, and that's the link. It's also in the live binders. Or you can subscribe via the RSS feed on our blog post uh, from our website using any RSS feed aggregator. So you can take us with you wherever you go if you happen to miss the live session, or you just want to review some of the information and review some of the activities and projects shared in the live session like there were today. We want to extend a very special thanks to Heidi for sharing this fantastic information and to Steve, who is the founder of our webinar series, and to Weebly for our website, as well as to each of you for your conversations and comments and the discussion, and to Blackboard so that we can meet in this platform each and every week. And we'll go back to questions now and pass it back to Heidi. So if you'd like to ask a question that we might have missed or you'd like to uh, make a comment or expand on something that we've discussed, please continue to post them in the chat or you can click on the, the hand and raise your hand and we'll give you the ability to use your mic to ask her your question personally. Lori, did you have any questions that I might have missed? Or weren't answered. Okay, great. And if anybody has any additional questions, uh, please feel free to do so. And Heidi's contact information is also in the live binder in case you think of something um, that you'd like to ask her, like after the session has closed out. I know I think of a lot of questions afterwards. I'm like, oh, I should have asked that question. And Heidi, would you? Um, do you have something that you'd like to demonstrate using Scratch 
that video that you showed with Bailey was really, really in, uh, helpful in understanding how um, simple that you can get with using Scratch with younger students. So thank you for that. And yeah. thank Bailey. She was she taught me a lot. I will do that. I know if Doug's still in the room, I can pull up uh, one of the advanced projects that one of my that that advanced math student did. And I did find a couple of questions that Kim didn't ask. Okay, great. Go ahead, Lori. Okay, one was, um, what does costume mean in Scratch? Okay, let me do, let me, can I share my desktop and then I will show you guys what Scratch looks like. Yes, please do. Okay. Let's do that. All right. So, close out of this one. I'll just open up a blank scratch here. I had all these projects open for the other ones that I was doing, so okay. There we go. So now we have a blank scratch board. So when it talks about costumes, costumes are over here in the center. All of your characters are called sprites. So this is a sprite. Here's where you would create your new sprites, just as an overview. You can paint sprites that has a drawing board or you can actually import sprites that Scratch already has set up and it has a pretty good uh, list that you can choose from. So these are all sprites and again when you, the kids start working on animations they go to the center here and then what they do is they create a series of them and they alter them slightly and then just keep switching their costumes in order to make it show, make it seem like it's moving. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I had any other questions directly related with how to use Scratch, but that certainly was. Um, I'll just show real quick too, since I'm sharing my screen and I have it up here, that mine ball game, which was like a PowerPoint presentation, but it has some of the advanced programming that's involved with that. So he created a variable with power that when you push the up arrow key, the power on the ball is faster, and if you push the down arrow key, down key, the power that you throw the ball will be slower. So he really went into some more advanced programming. This uh, same student actually created also a slingshot, very much like Angry Birds, and that slingshot actually has trigonometry involved with it. And something somebody else asked this too. The nice thing about Scratch is that you can actually open up a program and download it in Scratch that you see that you like so that you can see what it looks like. The first thing you have to do on the Scratch website though is create your own login. In order to be able to download projects and upload them for sharing, you have to have uh, a login. And what I would recommend, what I did when I did this with my students at Bayside, is I created one login and then all the kids used that same login and uploaded their projects to the same place. Because we also started to talk about feedback. What does giving people good feedback look like? And they would actually post comments and they were assessed on how well they were providing feedback to their classmates based on their projects. But that slingshot one, well, you know what? And this is the one bad thing because I'm trying to get everything changed over to the new one, which is my instruction instructor one because I'm no longer at Bayside. I still have a few projects over in the Bayside area. And while you're logging in, um, somebody mentioned the Mayan ball game one. That was a student project, correct? Correct. Yes, that was a seventh grade social studies project. Again, a PowerPoint presentation that kids were supposed to do.
but because this kid could do it faster and had these advanced math skills, he created the PowerPoint at the beginning part that went through all the content and then actually had the game at the end that they could play that he programmed. Okay, so that's not one that they could download or purchase at teachers, helping teachers. I'm sorry? They asked if they could uh, download the mind ball game from teachers saying teachers. Oh, that's free. All you have to do is go to the Scratch. I'll show you how to download them where I'm at now. So here's that okay. mind ball game. I'll show you with the slingshot that the same student made. So once you have your login, these are all free. So you can see the programming. It'll say in the upper right hand here, download this project. And if you download and just click on the name, it'll actually open it up in Scratch itself. So, and all these are free. So here's uh, the programming of this one. And as you can see, and you're talking about some of the, the higher math and chemistry and physics skills, here he's using velocity, okay? And he's actually using the tangents and the absolute values of different things. And I'm not even going to pretend I would know how to do this because I would not. High school is not my forte. But this involves trigonometry. And when he showed this, he went to ISTE 2011 and showed this project. He had uh, captured quite a bit of attention from some of the people that were there because of what he was doing. So let me close this out. And so when you play the game, it's basically this is how and it has the same programming that they used when they programmed the slingshot in Angry Birds. So they were quite impressed with it. And I'll bring the screen back. So while you're switching screens, Heidi, a question that somebody asked was, if you do embed this into a blog, does that person have to have Scratch in order to play the game? No. That's the nice thing. You can embed it right into the blog, and they do not need to have Scratch to play it. Scra the, only nice. way, the only reason you have to download Scratch is to be able to create the games. Okay. Create them, modify them, use mm -hmm. part of the programming in another game, say. Right. Oh, I'm not seeing. Where is? I'm not seeing my toolbar up here, guys. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Are there tutorials for students? Um, there's not as many tutorials for students per se, but if you go to the Scratch mm -hmm. website and click under support, they're starting mm -hmm. to put more and more video types of tutorials. And again, if you go to the K-8 programming playground, um, there will be a whole section there that I'm going to go live with probably shortly after this show that will have um, kind of directions for kids based on what they do. So if they want to create a PowerPoint, it'll say, okay, download this project, look at the programming of this project and that kind of thing. That's terrific. I think those are the ones that I had as far as questions. Yeah. And if you go to YouTube, you can YouTube, and there's quite a few uh, videos on YouTube for different things too based on what the kid wants to do. A lot of kids have posted YouTube videos on how they created their projects up there. Mm-hmm. Terrific. So basically, you can take anything that you've created in another app and expand and add something to it in Scratch. I'm not sure I follow you there. Like, you can open like they were talking about, project. like they were talking about taking a PowerPoint, putting that in, and creating the game, or adding audio and the animation to the PowerPoint video. I'm yeah, sorry, you can't actually PowerPoint. import necessarily a PowerPoint into it, but you can set it up and create okay. it like you would a PowerPoint. With different slides and scenes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, instead of taking the image and putting the okay. image onto a PowerPoint slide, you're putting the image into the stage or creating it as a sprite within Scratch. I see. Okay. Okay. 
the video that I showed you guys at the very beginning, and I don't know if you guys still have that link, but you know that might be something that we want to throw out there just again. It, it, it's a great video for motivation for kids and even to bring to your district technology coordinator or your administrator to show why it's so important that we teach kids to program. Bill Gates right now has a website called codecode.org where they're trying to get more visibility to the fact that we need to bring these type of things to all our kids. Many countries are jumping on the bandwagon and, and creating things where kids are programming K-8 or K-12 so that the kids have access to learning how to program. And I can definitely see how this would really help with sequencing and thinking critically and analytically and logically and developing those skills. Yep. Amazing. I knew there was a lot that you could do with it, but I didn't realize there was um, such a wide array of things that you can do with so many different levels. Yeah, and the other nice thing is that uh, when you're using Scratch, you're really tying into, you know, like you said, like that computational and that critical thinking piece that the Common Core is trying to get at. One of the one thing that I know that kids love to do are debugging exercises. So creating a programming thing that is wrong and saying, okay, now work in teams and figure out what's wrong, fix it, make it work. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Definitely a challenge. And if any of you have projects that you've done with your students using Scratch that you'd like to share, you can always post those in the chat. As well as I'm looking for the link to our Deagle group, you can later on um, after the show, you can post them and uh, send the links through our Deagle group for Classroom 2.0 Live and share the resources that way as well. or if your students do something at a later after this session with Scratch that you would like to share, we would love for you to, to include that and send those through the Deagle group so that we can see those as well. And the link that you just posted here in the chat will also be included in our chat log and in the live binder. so that people can follow up with those at a later time. And those of you in the recording can also access these links. And Sophia, are you asking if you can create use Scratch within Prezi or create within Prezi? Scratch within Prezi. You might be able to link to a video using Prezi, uh, using Scratch. Go ahead, Hattie. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't tried to do it in Prezi, but my gut instinct would say it might be possible because they have the embed code, and the, the embed code is HTML language, just like it is when you embed other things in Prezi. So my guess is it would work, but I have not tried it. I'm not sure about the file size or the, the limits within Prezi, but you could probably link to short animation um, snippets. And if you do try it, again, once you get it embedded and it works, feel free to share it through the Deco group and tag it so that we can uh, see what you've done with your students or if it works. And again, this is another list of resources that you can use to learn more about using Scratch or projects that people have done with Scratch. And you can reach Heidi through a lot of these resources that are shown, as well as those that are in the Live Binder. They're all included. Oops, that's not the Live Binder link. Let me get the Live Binder link. So 
So are there any further questions? Uh, the Mayan ball game is in the LiveBinder link that I just posted in the chat, Sophia, so you can, it's on um, one of the tasks, so you can find that. And if there are any uh, last call for questions, if there's something that you'd like to ask before we close out the show for the day. If not, you can always contact Heidi afterwards and uh, she'll be available via email or whatever. So it looks like I, I'm not seeing any more questions come through. We all need to kind of try this out and then uh, see where we go. And please do share some of the sessions and projects that you have created with your students. We'd, we'd love to, to hear about things that you've done after our, our shows. So please share that. And thank you so much, Heidi. You're welcome. We really appreciate you sharing and um, giving us the support and encouragement to try these projects for ourselves and with our students. And be sure to join us next week when we're going to be talking with Jamie, who's um, another middle school teacher who works with uh, technology and has a variety of resources to share with us as well. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, and enjoy the first weekend in March. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you next week and online.